text allegation for attribute-based encryption by Amit Sahai, Hakan Seyalioglu, and Brent Waters. And Amit is going to begin with the talk. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, dynamic credentials for attribute-based encryption. This is a joint work with Hakan and Brent. And uh, thankfully, Allison gave this beautiful talk for me, so I don't need to give too much uh, background. But let me just remind you. Um, in fact, our work refers to both key policy and ciphertext policy ABE, but I'll focus on uh, CPAB, ciphertext policy ABE. So what's the situation? We have users in the system, and the users have credentials. They have certain attributes that describe them. For example, Bob here has top secret and forensics, let's say, as his attributes. And now someone, and, and uh, we provide him with a personalized secret key that somehow encapsulates the exact attribute set that he has, and that's given to the, to the user. Um, now a user, another, some external party potentially comes along and wants to encrypt a message, but he wants to specify a policy that uh, describes when and, and, and who should be able to, well, sorry, when, who should be able to decrypt the message. And let's say he does it by means of an and or tree. Um, and uh, uh, such as here. And now, of course, if Bob comes along, he will be able to decrypt it because his exact set of attributes do match this tree and uh, you know, everything will work out. So that's why he should be able to decrypt. That's the basic setup. Allison already talked about the proofs, the notions of security here. So uh, what this talk deals with is the setting of attribute-based encryption, but where users' credentials change over time. And really, this is something that is unavoidable in real life, right? People are hired, fired, transferred. Uh, these kind of events happen all the time. And we will need, in any real system, we would, of course, need to be able to support uh, dynamic keys, dynamic credentials. So um, how will we deal with this? That's what this talk is about. And uh, uh, we're going to deal with it in the usual way. We've, you know, our community has dealt with dynamic keys for many, many years. And the way we think about it typically is that uh, if a user's credential changes, then what we'll do is we'll revoke his old key and then issue him a new one, right? So really the problem is reduced to the problem of revocation, and revocation has a long history. So uh, we'll uh, use some of the usual frameworks, uh, that's the usual framework that our community has developed to deal with, uh, deal with dynamic keys. So we'll imagine that there is a, a periodic broadcast that are issued by the key authority. And we want these broadcasts to be efficient. We want them to essentially only depend on the number of users who are getting their keys revoked, not on the total number of users in the system. That's some basic efficiency property we would want. Um, and what's the purpose of this broadcast? The purpose is so that unrevoked keys, so people who have, whose keys are still valid, should be able to look at their old key, look at the public broadcast, put them together to now uh, put to, to, to form a newly valid key for the current time period, right? So they can update their key to make it still valid uh, today. And of course, the people who are revoked can't do this, and so they won't be able to update their keys. And so they'll end up being revoked. And now, uh, the other difference this, this engenders in the, in the system is that when you encrypt a message, you don't just specify a policy, you also specify the current time, right? The time at which you encrypt the message. And only someone who satisfies the policy and has a key that is valid for a time greater than or equal to t should be able to decrypt, right? This is the, these are kind of the standard ideas in revocation that we want to bring to bear to the ABE setting. Now, uh, the question that uh, really pushes this talk forward is, are, so I've talked about all the stuff that we've done before as a community, does that actually capture the security concerns we would have in the ABE setting. And in fact, the main point of this talk is that we think the answer is not quite. So there are some additional security concerns that we have to deal with in the ABE setting, that is, which is I'm going to spend most of this talk on. And, and the reason for this is the following, that when we've looked at revocation in the past in this community, typically we've either been looking at a per-party communication setting, where so a message is going to a single party, or a broadcast setting. And in each of these settings, you can only worry about the future, right? Because the messages that I've already sent were already broadcast. You already have them if you had a valid key. So there's no sense of protecting the past. It just doesn't make sense. So we don't think about that problem. But as I'll argue, in the ABE setting, in sort of the prototypical examples of applications of ABE, 
this issue of protecting the past is actually important. So we'll illustrate this with a motivating example that I'll give in a moment. I want to mention this was inspired by a wonderful conversation with Thomas King and Daniel Manchala uh, over at Xerox in Los Angeles, and we definitely thank them for inspiring this work. So what's the motivation? We have a company. It has a server set up uh, that's going to use AVE for access control. So the server will only host uh, encrypted files, right, ciphertext, that are encrypted using AVE. And we have users that are going to access it. Now, the situation that we consider, though, is one where uh, a good employee, let's consider some particular good employee, um, he, he can go to the server and download files and decrypt them, but these servers, they log access. There are other mechanisms in place which incentivize the, the good employee to be careful, right? So when he needs a particular file, he goes to the server, he downloads that particular file, he decrypts it, and he makes use of it. He may have the authority to access thousands of files, but because of other incentives in the system, he only accesses the files that he actually needs. So there are many files that he doesn't access. And now, uh, now let's consider the bad scenario. So the employee goes rogue, perhaps he's fired or he does something that causes him to be fired, and at that point we revoke his key. Now let's again think about the standard uh, security guarantee here. The standard revocation idea would say that at the moment he's revoked, any files that are encrypted and added to the server in the future would be inaccessible to him. But you can see there's a problem now, right? Because uh, there are all these files on the server that existed beforehand. And in fact, the user did not have access to them before. And now he could potentially hack into the server, download all these files, and use his old key to decrypt, right? Because we didn't think about that. We didn't think about protecting the old keys. So that's the essential uh, problem uh, about protecting the past that we want to also address. So if you want to summarize what the security property is that we, that we, that we need, to, to put it in a single phrase, we just want that after a key is revoked, the employee shouldn't be able to access anything that he doesn't already have. So if he already had the files and he can decrypt, otherwise he shouldn't be able to do anything. And as I mentioned, it breaks down to, into two guarantees. The new issue that we're dealing with is the issue of files encrypted in the past. We want to make sure that old files that he used to be able to access are no longer accessible. And to our knowledge, it's the first time this kind of issue has been considered in, the, in our community. Um, uh, the other problem is this more standard one of files in the, in the future. Um, I also just want to mention this has been looked at in the context of IBE by a uh, nice paper of Boldreva, Goyal, and Kumar. Uh, they also looked at it in the context of AB where they were only able to get the selective notions of security. So one of the contributions of our paper is also to get the first scheme, even with the older notion, that has full security. And in fact, we achieve a single scheme that gets everything together. So we are able to more comprehensively address the issue of dynamic credentials for attribute-based encryption. All right. So um, let's look a little bit deeper at what's going on. Let's say for the moment that we were able to solve the second problem. I want to focus on the, the newer aspect of it. So let's say that we do have security for new files. In other words, we have a way to encrypt to a particular time t, and it can only be decrypted by users with secret key for a time greater or than or equal to t, right? So if you have a time t plus two key, you can decrypt. If you have time t minus one key, you cannot, okay? So this again is solving the future problem, and let's say we've already done that, right? And now we want to see how can we get security for, for these old files. So, uh, what are some natural, straightforward solution ideas? So perhaps the most straightforward solution idea would be to just tell the server, look, why don't you just decrypt all the files and then re-encrypt them with the new time, right? So just tell the server to go through all the files on the server, decrypt and re-encrypt. Now, this is a terrible idea from an ABE standpoint because the whole point of using ABE in this sort of prototypical application scenario is to make sure the server doesn't need to host any secret information, right? He doesn't need to have any secret keys um, in the server. And this solution would exactly require him to have secret keys, in fact, even to have the master secret key, which is terrible. So this is not what we want. Uh, another, maybe perhaps natural solution, which doesn't require any secret information, would just be to re-encrypt all the ciphertexts, right? So you, the server could just take the old ciphertext and just 
attach a wrapper around it, right? Encrypt the time t ciphertext to the time t plus one ciphertext. This was great, it would definitely work. The problem is that the overhead would be disastrous, right? The, the size would grow with t, the decryption time would grow with t as the onion layer is decrypted one uh, level at a time. So uh, these are sort of the obvious solutions. They don't, they have various drawbacks. And so basically this leads us to ask, and the main question we ask in the paper is, you know, can we allow the server to do this essential refreshing of the time without needing to either have any secret keys or grow the ciphertexts, right? So essentially what we're asking is that um, we want to uh, be able to have an encryption uh, to a time t and somehow with some public update procedure, update it to time t plus one, right? And if we can do this, and the server could do this for all the files every night, and this would prevent uh, a, a user whose key has been revoked from hacking into the server and downloading all the files and decrypting them, right? Because they would have been updated to time t plus one, and he only has a time t key, right? And indeed, really the, the, the critical thing to observe is that this process of changing time t to time t plus one is something that is making uh, the ciphertext only more restrictive, right? The, the, what you need in order to be able to decrypt the ciphertext only gets uh, more demanding. And because of that, of course, right, because we are only making the job harder for, uh, for the adversary, the existence of such a procedure does not uh, conflict with the security of the, of the encryption scheme, right? If, if, if we had the opposite problem, then it, that would be disastrous. If you, could, if you could update from T to T minus one, then that would, that would be, of course, a really, really bad idea. Okay, so, um, so this is what we wanna do. And uh, what we did was we stepped back a little bit and, um, sorry, and we call such a scheme a revocable storage scheme because it allows us to revoke storage that was already present. So what we did is we stepped back and thought about this more generally. And if you think about it more generally, what we're really asking for here is a way to have an ABE scheme where if I encrypt to some policy P, I want there to be a public procedure, it only needs the public key, that takes the ciphertext and a more restrictive policy P prime than P, and, adapt, and, then, and it should be able to convert the ciphertext under the policy P to a ciphertext under a policy P prime, which is more restrictive, right? This is just a special case of what I, I'm sorry, this is a generalization of what I said before, because the time constraint is such a policy, right, that you should have a greater than or equal to time, and by moving up the time, we're making it more restrictive. We wanna now look at the entire question. And this is the problem that we call ciphertext delegation. It's a similar to key delegation, but on the ciphertext side. And uh, we initiate sort of a systematic study of this, uh, of this question in the context of, uh, of ABE. So I wanted to give a quick uh, example of how ciphertext delegation works, uh, which essentially which shows the, the basic trick, which then works in essentially all known ABE schemes that, that currently exist. So, um, this is the uh, BSW scheme uh, with uh, John Bethencourt and Brent from 2007. Uh, the way it works is that uh, we have a master secret key which consists of two uh, um, exponents, you used to think of it this way, two numbers, alpha and beta. And the public key uh, has some number of things in it. Don't worry about these beta things. The, the main thing it has is this E that uses a, uses a pairing which stores E, G, G to the alpha. And suppose now we have some uh, ciphertext that has uh, just a simple and policy. So it needs the top secret, was a TS property, and the accounting property in order to be able to be satisfied. Now, um, how does it work? Well, you pick a secret S and you split it, you use an, a, a linear secret sharing scheme, in this case it's just simple additive secret sharing, um, into two shares, and the key Point, the main thing I want to point out is that the way the ciphertext works is it allows you to recover S in the exponent in, to, in order to be able to decrypt 
by storing these shares in the exponent, right? So somehow these things are stored in the exponent. So they're not directly visible. The shares are not directly visible. But the key property is that they are linearly operable, right? Because they're in the exponent, so you can raise to a constant, you can multiply things together, and you get linear operation. And that's going to be the key, the key thing for us, right? So now if you wanted to delegate this to a more restrictive policy, let's say by adding another criteria like and director, you also need the director attribute, then um, we can do it in a, in a fairly uh, uh, straightforward way, right? All I need to do is take the secret S that used to only be split into two shares and now split into three shares. And I don't know what these shares are, but it's still easy enough to do. I just pick a new random element and I stick that into S, right? I just, I just add it on, which I can easily do based on the public information, okay? Um, and this will have the right properties, right? It will be a new sharing of the same secret and uh, everything will, 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 will work out. Um, I'm skipping over some uh, silly details. Of course, we need to also re-randomize in the, in the standard usual way when you, when you want to refresh a secret share. So that, that sort of stuff is there. It can all be done again, crucially, just because in all of these schemes, the secret shares, we use a linear secret sharing scheme and they're in an exponent where, you are, where they are linearly operable. And uh, so we show how we can do this type of delegation in, um, uh, in, in essentially all the current ABE schemes. Uh, and we support a number of uh, efficient ciphertext delegation operations. Uh, if you think about a uh, policy as being specified by a, a, a tree of thresholds, right, so an and or tree is a special case, then we can increase a node threshold. We can, for example, we can turn an or into an and. We can increase a node threshold and add a new uh, child, right? That would be like taking an and of two things to an and of three things like we just saw. Um, uh, and we can also just delete subtrees, so we can, we can eliminate certain ways of, of satisfying the, the policy. And these uh, operations are a, are, a, are a nice set of operations. You can use this together with some tree structures to implement time, and that's how we solve the problem of time uh, uh, in a way that's uh, only uh, logarithmic in the number of time epochs that we can support. Uh, we also look at the more general case of just linear secret sharing schemes based on matrices, and we give a number of operations there as well. So to conclude, uh, what we do in this work is we define this notion of ciphertext delegation, and we give a number of efficient methods for ciphertext delegation. We use this idea of ciphertext delegation to solve this problem of revocable storage, of, of protecting the past in revocation. We also construct something I didn't mention at all in the talk, a fully secure AV scheme that achieves revocable security against future encryptions, a standard, more standard notion of verification. And then we try to combine all these things together to get a single AB scheme that has all of the nice properties and supports dynamic credentials. So with that, I'll end my talk. Thank you. <laughs>